wanted to start the uh, the photo that you see on the screen is of our Chesapeake, Virginia facility. Uh, that facility exports, imports, uh, crushes soybeans. Uh, it's really the centerpiece of our business operation. Um, we uh, we load vessels there uh, on an annual basis. Basis, we'll load about two and a half million tons of beans to uh, particularly to China. Uh, we do ship beans to Egypt, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, other places. Um, so wanted you to, uh, if you've not seen that facility, wanted you to be aware of that. Um, this second photo is of a, a soybean vessel that we had just completed. If you look just to the left of the channel, you'll see our elevator there in the background. But uh, we loaded a soybean vessel headed to China. So. I thought that was kind of a cool uh, photo to share with you. Um, Cassandra and Nick Willie had given me some topics maybe to discuss. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about Ukraine and Russia and what's going on there and the impact in the markets. Um, the macroeconomic situation has certainly got a lot of play over the last year and a half to two years and particularly with the banking situation. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Argentina has had a horrendous growing season, um, so I want to talk some about that and why that's important. Um, a relatively newcomer to our equation as agribusiness operators and farmers is renewable diesel. Um, so I've got some information that I want to share about that. Um, then we're just going to talk about some things that are influencing the corn market and soybean markets, and uh, we'll talk about price. Um, I know a, a lot of you maybe aren't in the markets every day, so I've tried to make this presentation as understandable or user-friendly as possible, but if you see something you don't understand, please raise your hand. Um, I, I realize it's the NCAA final game, but who cares about San Diego State and UConn, huh? Anybody? Oh, UConn? Born and raised in Connecticut. Okay. Go you Huskies. It's been a fun tournament. Um, so let's start with uh, the Ukrainian situation, remembering that this situation really started a year ago in February when R Russia invaded the Ukraine. Um, now Ukraine is typically, historically, annually a, a pretty sizable exporter, uh, particularly of uh, corn and wheat, and also sunflower oil, which if you use any products with sunflower oil, I think you've seen sticker shock over the past uh, year. Um, when Russia invaded Ukraine, basically all the exports stopped. Uh, now, they did start exporting a little bit by rail, a little bit by truck, some by barge, uh, but that went on for months where they were virtually dead in the water. Uh, they did arrive at an agreement uh, in August to allow three export facilities to start exporting by vessel, which that's where they really, uh, if they're going to do any business, it's got to be by vessel. That's the only uh, tonnage that you can get moved at some, some rates that are not exorbitant. Um, so they allowed three ports to start exporting again. They generally have about 10 port facilities. Um, they went on with that uh, and had some decent success, about 33 million tons of uh, exports from mid-August until recently. Um, that uh, agreement came up for renewal uh, about three weeks ago, and there was some question if Russia was going to allow it. Uh, so the parties involved are the UN, um, Ukraine, Russia, and Turkey. Um, and so they did agree to an extension, uh, but uh, uh, everybody else wanted a 120-day extension. Russia said, no, nope, I'm only in for 60 days. Now, I think it's politically motivated. Uh, Turkey, their president is uh, up for re-election. Uh, the results will be known about May the 9th, 10th, uh, and that president is very close with Putin. Um, so Putin really didn't want to extend the agreement without knowing if he was going to be reelected. Uh, so that's a little questionable as to what will happen. 
Um, you probably saw in the news that, uh, and I'm going to think back a little bit, uh, during the Winter Olympics, if you remember, uh, we saw on our television <coughs> screens uh, Xi and Putin uh, smiling, standing by each other, uh, good buddies. Uh, and here, uh, the week of March the 20th, she went to visit Putin in Moscow. First trip he had made uh, post the COVID opening. So that's a real important signal. If you watch China, they don't do things just in a small way. They've got a plan. Um, so it's certainly concerning as we see that relationship grow and develop. Um, one thing that is interesting about this too, if you look over the past uh, 10 to 12 years, China has put a lot of money into the Ukraine, building the infrastructure, building ports, and the reason being, Ukraine is a budding, growing uh, exporter, um, and lo and behold, uh, old buddy uh, Putin comes in and blows up the facilities uh, that, that she has been paying to build. Um, so that's an interesting twist. Uh, but what we hear is that uh, she has told Putin, look, wind down this military action, come to an agreement on some type of peace settlement. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, in the meantime, uh, three very important exporters out of Ukraine, uh, Cargill, Viterra, and Louis Dreyfus Company um, have decided they're going to stop exporting from Russia as of July the 1st. Now, the word is that they were uh, very strongly encouraged or recommended uh, to stop exporting. Uh, these companies operate globally. They know all kinds of environments. Uh, but apparently uh, Putin was very clear in the challenges that they would face. Um, so they've chosen to stop exporting and we believe that uh, Putin's objective is to control the price better because the only other companies exporting are Russian companies. So we'll see how that goes. Um, this just is a graphic and I apologize, I know that's difficult to see. Uh, but the big, uh, on the top is number of vessels that have shipped since they reopened the corridor. On the bottom is tonnage. Uh, and the big takeaway here is the amount that's going to China, Spain, and Turkey. Those are the big spikes in the blue lines that you see. So China, Spain, and Turkey um, are the ones that are, that are really taking the tonnage. Turkey has a real stake in this game. Uh, they're far and away a, a big importer of almost every ag product and uh, Russia is so close they need that Russian supply so if you see Turkey playing towards Putin's side uh, that's exactly why. Um, we'll talk about the macroeconomic situation a little bit and I must tell you I am not a banking expert um, but the timeline of some of the challenges that we faced here over the past month I've put up here. Um, how many before March the 10th had heard of Silicon Valley Bank? Okay, that's more than I would have expected. Uh, 16th largest bank in the United States uh, went bust uh, over the weekend of March 10th. Uh, followed very quickly by Signature Bank, which was the 29th largest bank. Um, interesting point, Barney Frank was a, a board member of the Signature Bank. If you remember Barney Frank from Dodd Frank, um, he was on the board, so uh, just an interesting point. Uh, Moody's downgraded several banks, Credit Suisse, uh, a large European bank, uh, took a huge loan and then ended up selling out to UBS. Uh, UBS, a much smaller bank than Credit Suisse. Um, and so there's a lot of fears out there. What's next? Which bank is coming up next? We know that Deutsche Bank has had some problems for some time. Um, so there's a question about how long they can sustain themselves. Um, with this backdrop, uh, the Fed was to meet on March the 22nd uh, to discuss interest rates. 
and they chose to increase the interest rates by 25 basis points or a quarter of a percent. Um, the expectation prior to these banks failing was that they would probably do a half point increase. Uh, so they've toned it down a little bit. Uh, the next meeting is in May. Um, the thinking is maybe they won't put another increase in May and that by the end of 2023, they'll actually start to reduce interest rates. So we'll see. Um, the inflation uh, uh, metrics that are out there are still showing very strong inflation, not increasing, but still very, very high rate from a historical perspective. Um, looking at crude oil, uh, crude oil, you know, topped out at about 130 bucks a barrel, uh, in March of 2022, so just a year ago, a little over a year ago, and a lot of that, of course, was driven by the Russian-Ukrainian situation, uh, but crude oil recently dropped down to 64 bucks a barrel, uh, got a little shot of gas over the weekend because uh, um, the uh, OPEC announced uh, production cuts um, and so crude oil was up to 84 bucks a barrel at one time today. I think it closed around 81 or something like that. Um, the, the dollar, the U.S. dollar, which for 110 years has been the bellwether, bellwether currency for the entire world, uh, traded up to almost 115 on the index in September of last year. Uh, dropped down to 101 this past February, and today was around 102.2. Um, so again, the U.S. dollar is still, if you look at what trades around the world, whether it's coal or iron ore or grain or whatever, vast majority trades basis U.S. dollar. It's a consistent currency. It's stable. Um, but now, we have seen some chinks in that armor here over the past year, uh, particularly with Putin. Uh, when he had the market where he wanted it, he said, you'll buy in rubles. And some people did that, uh, especially people in North Africa that had no choice. They had to have the supply. Um, we've also seen recently that uh, uh, Brazil and China arrived at a trade agreement uh, basis yuan, so basis the Chinese currency. Um, also saw that uh, just recently France and China arrived at an agreement on liquefied uh, natural gas basis the yuan. So there are some chinks showing in that armor in respect to dollar being the, the currency. Um, the Dow, uh, it was back up again today, I think 300 and some points. The S&P was up uh, 12, 15 points. Um, personally, I'm pretty encouraged. When we look at some of the problems that the world has faced, uh, the Dow and, and the S&P hasn't performed too badly. Um, we're down 10% um, uh, on the Dow and, and down 14 on the S&P. Uh, from its peak in uh, just over a year ago. Um, so we'll see how the market uh, withstands if there are any other banking issues. I certainly hope not, uh, but uh, not a bad performance in my opinion. Uh, there are some indicators that we do watch to see, you know, what is going on in this market. Um, the S&P, I said, you know, was, was down 14% uh, 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 since last January. Now, this year, the Dow, or the S&P is basically unchanged in this calendar year. But it is interesting, if you look, the S&P is made up of 500 stocks, and only eight of those have been positive in this calendar year. And that's why the S&P is now it's about unchanged, but that's why it's been supported. So that's an interesting factor. Um, also, the money market, and I'm sorry, this may be a little challenge or difficult to see, but if you look at that far right, that, that huge drop, 
Uh, these are monthly inflows of, of uh, money into the banks, and this goes back to 1973. Um, so since the SBB, Signature Bank, uh, Credit Suisse situation, there's been a tremendous amount of money that has gone out of the banks, especially small banks. I saw another breakdown of, uh, of the percentage from small banks and the percentage from large banks. And this draw is primarily coming from small banks as people move money into safer havens, uh, like money market accounts and that kind of thing. Um, one of those is also gold. I mean, whenever anybody gets concerned about the economy, concerned about the dollar, whatever the case might be, there's typically a pretty good inflow of dollars into gold. Now, this chart is puts and calls or options. And so you can see that uh, the market certainly reflected a very strong upward price bias in how they were positioning. And if you look at gold, uh, we're, we're a little bit below 2,000 bucks an ounce, uh, but there's only been about four times in history that we've been up to this kind of price level. Uh, so clearly, uh, people around the world are concerned about uh, the banking situation are putting money into what they think is a safer haven. Um, we'll talk about Argentina just a little bit, and, and I'll explain why. Uh, but um, if you look back to last October, when the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, who is the pre preeminent um, uh, crop analyst, crop forecaster around the world, uh, when they put out their production estimate for Argentina, uh, they forecast what was, were reasonable numbers. Uh, they said uh, 55 million tons of, soy, or of uh, corn and 51 million tons of soybeans. With normal weather, that was clearly doable in Argentina. Now, since that time, Argentina's been an incredible drought. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're worst in history. Um, and so their crop has just uh, shriveled up and, and died. Um, in, Oct or in March, uh, the government cut their production forecast by 15 million in total on corn and down by, what, 18 million on beans. Now, the market thinks that they're still too high. Uh, the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange, who is uh, very good at forecasting Argentine production, uh, called the crop uh, 36 million uh, corn and 24 million beans. And I can tell you since that time, I've heard lower numbers. Uh, so Argentina has a serious problem. And this is after their wheat crop just burn up. Um, and Argentina relies very heavily on uh, taxation from exports uh, for their, their economy. Um, so they are going to struggle, I can tell you. Uh, their inflation rate has just been going through the roof. Uh, a guy was telling me last week that from the prior week, his cost of groceries, same items, went up 10% in one week. Uh, that's just not sustainable. Um, so, um, now, why is this important to the grain markets? Uh, generally, typically, Argentina is a huge exporter of soybean meal and soybean oil. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the, the largest in the world and not by a small amount. Uh, this year, um, they're, not, they're gonna be number two in bean meal exports because they just don't have the supply to export. Uh, suspect their oil is going to go down quite dramatically too. Um, and so it puts a lot of pressure when you take the world's preeminent uh, soybean meal exporter and drop them down to number two or maybe number three. It puts a lot of pressure particularly on uh, Brazil and the United States to pick up that slack. Um, so we'll see how that all sorts out. Argentina has just really gotten started on their bean harvest, uh, but the yields thus far look terrible and the quality looks bad. Uh, they've got very shriveled, small green beans 
uh, which is going to be very difficult to process. Um, any questions on any of that before I move on to the next topic? So their yield on oil is going to be down tremendously as well with the quality of the beans. I would certainly think so. I mean, the, the photos that I've seen of their early harvested beans, they're going to have a very difficult time extracting what would be a normal percentage of oil and meal. Uh, I would imagine there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, hauls there, basically. Not a good situation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about renewable diesel, and you all may be familiar with this topic, but really renewable diesels just come on uh, the horizon within the past couple of years. Um, so you might be familiar with biodiesel. Uh, biodiesel uh, requires a blend of a certain amount of, of regular diesel fuel with a certain amount of oil, uh, but it's, it's relatively small. And most of the oil that has gone into biodiesel has been soybean oil. Um, now as we move forward, renewable diesel has come onto the horizon. Uh, California, uh, Washington, Oregon, uh, currently have um, uh, legislation, I guess I would say, in place uh, where they're using biodiesel um, and they're going to ramp up that usage over a period of years. There are other states that are considering it, uh, Minnesota, New York, Pennsylvania, um, but I would imagine, at least the market believes, that, that renewable diesel uh, growth is going to be quite uh, large. Now, one thing that is quite different about renewable diesel is that you can take a variety of oils, uh, whether it's tallow, uh, the distiller's corn oil, um, 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 soybean oil, uh, use cooking oil, and, and you can make renewable diesel just by simply, I shouldn't say simply, it's quite an intricate process, but by processing it, you can use that oil straight up without any blend. Uh, and so there's been plenty of plants that have gotten or built um, uh, to take advantage to, uh, to produce this renewable diesel. Now, something that's on the horizon, uh, that really I would tell you there's not a great deal of use yet, uh, but sustainable aviation fuel, uh, if, if we get to where this comes into play, uh, you're talking about billions and billions of gallon uh, of, uh, of uh, renewable fuel that could be utilized. Uh, so we're certainly moving in this direction, but not there yet. Um, this graph or chart just shows you the growth projections of renewable diesel. Um, so we're projecting from uh, 2020 uh, out to uh, well just probably 2026 almost uh, what a tenfold increase in renewable diesel production um, that's unbelievable huge growth in a very short period of time um, so how do we get that well today uh, this is uh, 2022 data uh, but still the vast majority is coming from soybean oil, uh, used cooking oil, I'll talk about in just a minute, uh, dis and, and distiller's corn oil uh, coming up with about 36%, and then you've got uh, primarily beef tallow, uh, canola, uh, white grease, and poultry fats. Um, the Renewable diesel has a carbon intensity score that comes along with it. Um, so the better scores, the better the profit. Um, and the best score that is in the marketplace is this used cooking oil. Now, I think we'd all be a great fan of that. We're taking something that's basically used up, dispensed, uh, and we're going to turn it into fuel. Thumbs up. Good stuff. Um, the issue is there's just not enough of that. Um, now, just recently, in the past few months, 
uh, we've seen a substantial amount of used cooking oil be imported in the United States from China. Um, and so there's a lot of question about that. Does it meet the requirements? Does it meet the criteria? Is that really what we're looking for? Um, so I would imagine, I, I can say this, the used cooking oil market is um, uh, a very good market and is going to be highly sought after in this uh, renewable diesel sector. Um, the second and best, uh, well I shouldn't say second, tallow and poultry fats and white grease have very good carbon intensity scores too, uh, which gives them good subsidies, but there's just not very much of that. Um, dis distiller's corn oil comes from the ethanol production process. So in an ethanol plant, you'll, uh, you'll of course make ethanol and then you'll have dried distiller's grains, which is used for feed. Um, and then the corn oil is extracted out of that process and can be used by, uh, in the feed market or it can be used by renewable diesel. And the demand for that has been very strong. So again, I see that as a good thing. Uh, we're taking you know, a product out of corn, which we generally have a lot of, which benefits farmers if we find more markets for this. Yeah, so the question is, how do you get to use cooking oil? And yes, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, uh, Hardee's has an agreement with the company um, and they take their used cooking oil when they're, they're done with it and dispense. You know, it used to be very problematic for a lot of these restaurants. Uh, and now it's, it's an outright dog fight to buy that stuff. Um, now it's not easy or simple because you've got multiple, you know, fast food restaurants all over the place. Uh, so it's a challenging collection process, but they're making, uh, the renewables diesel will pay uh, pretty good money to do that. So the system is gonna find the efficiency and the effectiveness to use a used cooking oil. Um, with this renewable diesel build out, because again, we're not gonna have enough of this to suit the demand that's gonna be required for this and so what's happening is that the expectation is this has to be used in greater quantity um, and so we're seeing a lot of new soybean plants built now again good thing for farmers gives you more market outlets um, but this is just a list of of the plants and the locations that have been announced to be built uh, and the timing now there is some expansion here too, not totally new build, but I would tell you the vast majority of this is total greenfield site new built plants. Um, was talking to a guy up in uh, Spiritwood, uh, North Dakota the other day, I don't see them on there. Oh, there it is. And I said, hey, how's, how's the weather up there as you're building that new plant? And, he didn't say anything very kind to me and quickly hung up. Uh, but uh, they, they face some challenges on getting these plants built. It's not just the timeliness, um, the, the ability to get equipment, the ability to get staffing, uh, costs have exploded. You know, several of these plants were announced as long as like say two years ago, um, the, their cost has just gone through the roof. Um, but if this comes about, um, most think that the increase in, in crush will be 600 to 700 million bushels of soybeans uh, by the time we get to about the year 2026. So that's a substantial growth. Yes, sir. At what price does the price of beans have to be compared to crude? to match up price-wise on the diesel, or is it by mandate that has to be done? Uh, excellent question. I don't think there's a calculation to that because it depends on the legislation. 
Um, so far, California, Ar uh, Oregon, Washington have basically said, uh, we'll write the check. Just, this is what we're going to do. Now, will everybody do that? I'm not convinced of that, uh, but that's certainly the direction that everybody's moving, thinking that Minnesota, Pennsylvania, New York, and other states will follow suit. But, but it's sort of like RINs on, you know, on ethanol, basically, where they have to run up to a level. Is, is that what they're trying to do here? Yeah, there's a certain, yes, so for what he's talking about, for ethanol, there's what's called renewable identification numbers that there is a certain quantity that the market has to use every year. Um, thus far, for renewable diesel, that's not the case because it's mandated by state. Whereas the uh, ethanol industry is US-wide, the EPA agreed to do that, but renewable diesel is, has not moved that direction yet. Does that help or answer? Yeah. 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 I remember hearing, <coughs> excuse me, when, when soy, for, uh, when corn first was being used as uh, fuel um, in our gasoline, that it spiked the price for a lot of poor countries that depended on that as food. Is this going to be the effect with soy? There's certainly a lot of debate about that, the food versus fuel. Um, I don't know that I've got an answer for that. I would say this, if this projection turns out to be correct, there's certainly going to be a lot of support on oil prices, which should then fall back through the chain uh, to bean prices and meals a different story. Meal will probably go the other direction, um, but it certainly should be supportive to soy oil and soy beans. Yes, sir. We're not doing this in a vacuum, too, are we? And there are other countries that are also incorporating renewable and biodiesel into their fuel streams. So, regardless of what we're doing, it almost, I won't say it doesn't matter. But, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brazil, European Union, China are all incorporating biofuels into their yeah, Europe, Europe is actually ahead of us on this, and, and you know, they're very, very good at, at collecting used cooking oil and those kind of things and putting it in the fuel stream. Um, just my opinion, I am not an expert on what's going on worldwide, but just my opinion, it seems like that we are prepared to throw more money at it than the other countries. I don't see Brazil doing this, certainly not China or India. Um, so by the, the looks of a 40,000 foot level, I would say, yeah, we're bearing a, a pretty substantial portion of the load. Yeah. Don't we have farms that can come online and actually create more, um, or are we losing farmland In the United States? Yes. Yeah. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. The question was, are, are, are we uh, maintaining our farm ground in the United States or are we losing farm ground? They, um, the, the answer is we're losing farm ground and it, it's primarily going to urbanization. Uh, a lot of ground gets gobbled up every year by new build. Um, now, the good thing is that yield has been able to continue to increase. Um, we've had some stutter steps, um, but uh, by the grace of God, the yield has been able to improve and we've been able to offset that. And the projections are that we will continue to do that and be able to offset that loss. To follow up that challenge question, can you get more specific as far as Delmarva? Oh boy, I don't. I don't know that answer specifically for the Del Marva. I can tell you by looking around because I live up by Bethany Beach and I see the ground that's being chewed up uh, annually. I would say that, yeah, we're declining 
whether that decline is a bigger decline than the entire United States, I'm not sure. Will that decline be to the point where Purdue and your other integrators say we can't get, because we're in a corn deficit area anyway, start with it. Does it get to the point where you say, gee, we've got to move somewhere else? Is that totally killed agriculture on Del Mar? Um, I would say it hasn't yet. Could it have the potential of doing it? Certainly. Um, but it's, it's a challenge. If you think about the entire system of, of like of Purdue, I mean, we've got a, a big system of things to try to displace, to move from here to there. I and mean, hatcheries, feed mills, uh, farm operations that, that are great expertise in, in raising poultry. It's not a simple thing to do. Um, I have seen total new build hog operations that would have gone to North Carolina a few years ago that have gone back to the Midwest. Now, they didn't close anything, uh, but they had new builds and they chose to put it there for a variety of different reasons. Uh, but they're also facing tremendous pushback uh, in permitting issues and staffing and all those. I, I know uh, a hog uh, company that tried to build in Iowa, I mean, they virtually had a caravan around the entire state trying to look for someone that wanted them to come there. They were talking about investing millions of dollars and creating new jobs, and they didn't want them. Um, so there's some challenges. Uh, you know, it's just not quite so simple to just pick up and move. But we're going to face challenges. I mean, if we're looking ahead 10 years, 20 years, the, the shore is going to face challenges on, on uh, replacing the farm ground that we're using. Well, one of the big issues now is solar farms. That's the high issue, uh, which I hate the term solar farms because they're not farms as far as I'm concerned. But if you're losing ground that way, uh, then on the flip side, sit on the, the Queen Anne's County, Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Foundation, where we're fighting like crazy to preserve on land. Thank God we've got 40% reserved in Queen Anne's County, but, but is that going to be enough on Del Marva to preserve agriculture? I, mean, I guess that's, that's a concern a lot of us. I, I share your concern. I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, predicting uh, the apocalypse or anything. It's just that there's going to be challenges for sure. I saw on that line about the solar plants, I saw an article the other day that uh, in Europe they put solar panels on the railroad tracks and I'm thinking, yeah, why not? I mean, that makes sense. So we need to consider some of those kind of things. Just one quick thing and I'll shut up. But you can think back to Purdue, I've often thought, why can't we retrofit the poultry houses on Delmarva to accept solar panels instead of going on prime class one class two farm Agree 100%. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Tim, one quick question. Uh, yeah. How much of what the other states are doing related to promoting renewable diesel has to do with climate change and the carbon, in, carbon footprint that it makes versus oil? A lot. I mean, uh, so from a U.S. citizen standpoint, would you like to take a product that has very little use and turn it into something that has great value? Certainly, like a used cooking oil. Now, to get there, you're going to have, I mean, if you think about the days of when ethanol started, we paid pretty sizable subsidies to get that industry going. They don't pay the subsidies anymore, but the mandates still exist. And so, this is not going to be a free cost of entry. I mean, there's going to be a substantial price to pay to get this up and running. And so I do appreciate California, Oregon, Washington being the spearhead, but there's certainly a question about should we bear the entire brunt of it? Uh, I can, I, if I would have put up a chart of India and Chinese coal consumption over the past few years, it's gone through the roof. Why? Nobody wants it. 
and so China buys it cheaply. So that's a big, big discussion. Uh, this is this just shows the plants geographically, uh, soybean plants and where they're being built. You know, a lot in the Midwest, of course, uh, big soybean supply, but also presently the pull for the oil is to the west. And so that's a lot of your driver as to why they're being built where they are. They do show our plant on here in Chesapeake. And yes, we do have an expansion going. Uh, we presently supply very, very little oil uh, that's going into the renewable diesel sector. Most all of our oil is going into the food sector. We've got a refinery in Salisbury, and we re refine it and, and ship it. Uh, one thing about soybean oil, and this chart goes back to 2000, 2001, uh, soybean oil exports out of the United States are basically going to be a thing of the past. I mean, they won't go to zero because we've got some demand in the Caribbean uh, that we'll probably economically source but the vast majority of the oil production will stay in the United States, soybean oil. Um, let's talk about corn just a little bit, um, and both in the U.S. and worldwide, uh, corn is in very, very tight supply this year. Uh, a lot of that is because the United States crop uh, this past year was good, it wasn't great, uh, but then you melted down uh, the Argentine crop and so world and then of course we've had the restrictions in Ukraine and so world supplies have really gotten tight. Um, Brazil uh, raises two different corn crops. A first crop that is planted um, in about October, November um, and then uh, which is about a quarter, 25% of their crop and then the bigger size, or 75% of their crop, is what they call the safrina crop, second crop. And so they'll harvest soybeans and then plant corn behind it. Um, and that crop is almost all planted. It's about 96% planted. Um, be because the world supplies are so tight, uh, there's a lot of pressure. Brazil needs to uh, perform. First of all, they need to raise the crop. And then secondly, they need to be able to export it when that demand is there. Um, I would tell you so far as of April the 3rd, they're in pretty good shape. The corn crop has gotten planted a little bit later than you would like, uh, but so far the conditions look pretty good. Um, so we're certainly hoping that that crop comes on okay. Um, USDA came out on Friday, this past Friday, with their plantings intentions report, uh, and they're calling acres up 4% from last year at 92 million acres. Um, if we get a trend line yield, and a trend line yield is about 178 to 180 bushels an acre in the United States, then we could raise a 15 billion bushel corn crop. We've only done that twice before in history. Um, so the prospects are good if we get those kind of plantings, um, but the market's going to be watching that Brazilian crop very, very closely. Another thing that's popped up just uh, here um, in the past three weeks, uh, China, who has in the past three years been the world's largest importer of corn, uh, bought 3.27 million tons of U.S. corn. Uh, now, that doesn't mean much probably, but that's about 10 million bushels more uh, than the state of Pennsylvania raised this year. So in about a three-week period of time, China bought a pretty sizable chunk of corn. Um, they are notorious for coming when prices drop. They're notorious for coming buying large tonnage and putting it into storage. This is just a graphic that shows uh, the Chinese purchases uh, by day during the month of, uh, of March. I thought it was kind of a slick chart, so I threw it in there. Um, one concern, did somebody have a question? No. One concern that I have about this, uh, 
crop that we're about to plant is the, the snowpack that we've got in the northern plains. Uh, so basically, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, and part of Minnesota, um, historically high uh, snowfall this year. Um, and so the snowpack is the highest that they've had in history. Um, what that can result in uh, is pretty tremendous flooding. Um, and we, of course, don't want that to be prolonged. I mean, you don't want flooding at all. But from a crop standpoint, we don't want that to be prolonged because it delays planting or maybe even causes the inability to plant. Um, this, this graphic here shows the water equivalent, and, and I'm sorry, this is about a week old, uh, but the water equivalent of that snowpack um, at that time. Now, tonight I looked and saw Rapid City, South Dakota is supposed to get 8 to 10 inches of snow. Uh, some parts of South Dakota since last Thursday through Wednesday are supposed to get upwards of 30 to 32 inches of snow. Um, so you can add that right on to the top of this. Now, the good thing is, after this snow ends probably on Wednesday, it looks like they're going to warm up. Uh, they've even got some 60s forecast for uh, the weekend and next week. Um, so that snow is going to start to melt. Uh, good luck to those people along the Red River Valley because they're going to have tremendous uh, flooding problems up there. Um, this is a graphic from last year. Now, I put it on here because it's the amount of prevent plant acres. If you're familiar with uh, crop insurance, uh, you can uh, insure your acres, um, and there are certain dates that if, if you plant after a certain date, you can declare crop insurance, and you can leave that ground fallow or find another use for it. Uh, last year, those very same states, the Northern Plains, had a very, very high percentage of prevent plant. Uh, we certainly don't want that to happen again this year. We've already got very tight supplies in both corn and beans. Uh, prevent plant could be a real problem. Uh, this is a graphic showing the corn planted acres and millions of acres. Uh, so we're up a little bit this year, still not as high as we've been in the past few years. Um, if you're curious about where the east lines up, the darker the color, the higher the percentage of increase. Uh, so those blue states are 10% and higher from last year. Um, here in Maryland and Delaware, I think the numbers are around 5-7% higher from last year. That's what the government calls it, okay? Um, we talked just a little bit uh, before the meeting about fertilizer, and I saw this and I thought I would share it with you. Uh, this just discusses uh, urea, uh, but uh, urea price has really dropped significantly from last year. This red line shows, and this goes back um, 2010 up to this year. Uh, see, the urea price is considerably less than last year. Same thing for nitrogen, potash. Not down nearly as much as what urea is, but uh, uh, just thought I would share that with you. Uh, looking at the soybean situation, very similar to corn, very, very tight. Um, and uh, Brazil, conversely, has a phenomenal crop. They're about 76% harvested, uh, far and away the biggest crop they've ever had, but Argentina's crop is miserable. Um, so we're going to experience some supply tightness until we can get the U.S. new crop, assuming that we have a good crop here. Um, USDA calls plantings 87.5 million acres. Um, that's unchanged from last year. Uh, if we can have a trend line yield, which is about 51 and a half to 52 bushels an acre, we can raise a record bean crop. A uh, lot of ground to cover before we get there, but the prospects are there. 
Uh, but the market is going to watch very, very closely uh, to see how this U.S. new crop starts off. Um, I talked about Brazilian beans, and I just wanted you to see that uh, this is a uh, price in western Paraná, uh, large uh, uh, province of production in Brazil. Uh, their bean price dropped off significantly, uh, and it equaled uh, a price that they hadn't seen since December of 2020. Now, you would expect that with this huge crop. Um, so a lot of beans have been moving in Brazil. Uh, China has bought a tremendous amount of Brazilian beans recently. This is a graphic showing bean acres uh, as forecast by the United States, uh, USDA. So almost unchanged for the past three years. Uh, and down from what we had seen a few years ago. Um, again, the, the darker the color, the higher the percentage of increase. Conversely, uh, these red and pink means a decline from last year. And here on the shore, um, I think their forecast to be down about 4%. Um, I wanted to share some price history with you. For those of you that are not chartists, I'll try to explain this a little bit. But uh, this line is your, your timeline. And I've done this chart in, in monthly averages. This chart is, or this, uh, the vertical axis is the price in dollars and cents per bushel uh, for that given month. Uh, today we settled at uh, what, 658 or thereabouts on May corn. Um, the big takeaway here is $7 a bushel is really tough to sustain. You know, we've had a few spikes where we've gone above $7 a bushel, but you can see it's pretty fast and pretty furious. Uh, whenever we get up to that $7 mark, it generally doesn't last very long. Same thing for beans, timeline uh, the same, dollars and cents per bushel. Uh, we settled today at uh, what, 1522? Um, $15 a bushel is uh, very similar to corn. Uh, trying to sustain $15 a bushel usually is, is a pretty fast and furious market. Um, the mix is there this year maybe to have, you know, we've had occasions where we've got up to $17 uh, to $18 a bushel. And I'm not forecasting that, but I'm saying that there is some possibility because supplies are so tight. Uh, this crop has to get planted good. It has to have good growing conditions or supplies are going to get excessively tight. Question. Yeah. Is that because of the other uh, pressure on uh, other commodities that, that growers use um, and therefore they need to get that type of price? It certainly played a role, but that's not the, the primary role. I mean, uh, the, the primary influence has been just simply supply and demand. Uh, a lot of demand, not enough supply. Um, and so that has driven the price up uh, quite strongly. Inflation plays a role, no doubt, uh, but that's not the primary driver. Uh, looking at wheat, uh, which I know that's all near and dear to your hearts, but uh, again, timeline back to 1993 or thereabouts, dollars and cents per bushel, uh, you can see we had a huge spike in wheat prices uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, that has dropped off quite markedly. Uh, we're at, uh, what, $6.93 or $6 today. Um, wheat is really going to be a follower of corn. I mean, if we look around the world, there's no major supply issues. 
the tightness coming from Ukraine certainly doesn't help. Uh, but Australia last year had a record crop. Canada had a great crop. India had a good crop. Um, the United States uh, not so good, especially in spring wheat. Uh, but as we look at this year's crop, India's got a pretty good crop coming. They've got some hot weather that's uh, deterring that. The, the Australian crop will be down, or at least by all appearances. Uh, but I don't see anything in wheat that, that really uh, should cause a tremendous price spike other than if something does go wrong uh, and they do shut off Ukraine again, that will certainly lend support. Uh, but for the most part, wheat is going to be a, a follower of corn. And we're going to have to feed some wheat this year especially the soft red crop that, that is uh, grown in the eastern United States. We've got a really big crop coming. Uh, crop scores are good. Um, supplies are going to be burdensome in a lot of areas. Um, so we're going to have to feed some wheat. And I'm not talking about the chicken sector. It's primarily going to be cattle and hogs. Chicken just don't eat that much uh, wheat, really. Um, so some price projections, uh, and these are just my opinions, and they're only futures prices, not cash prices. I, and I'm only going to put it on here for three months, so I'm just talking about this current crop year, not new crop, okay? Um, I would say the range is 575 on the low side to 750 on the high side. You know, to get to this 575, I think you've got to have that, that Brazilian crop keep coming. It's got to be a good crop. If there's any problems there, or if the United States has any problems in their growing crop, then we might test this level. Uh, beans, 1375 on the low side, 1650 on the high side. Um, and so we pretty much know what the Brazilian crop is. I mean, they're close to 80% harvested. It's a really good crop. We know the Argentine crop is miserable. Um, we need to have the United States crop get planted timely, get off to a good start. Uh, if we don't, you know, we might challenge that level. Um, Chinese demand has been a little bit tainted because, um, you know, of all the COVID issues they had and their economy was not very good. Um, but overall, the world demand for soybeans continues to grow. Wheat, uh, again, I'm going to say it's a follower of corn. Uh, so if you take uh, corn price and add uh, 50 to 75 cents to it, that's probably what your wheat price is going to be. Because that follows the, the feed market pretty closely. Question? Yeah. Uh, are, at three months, uh prediction is that old crop or just just old crop I can give you some comments so the question was was this just on old crop I can give you some ideas on new crop uh, December corn futures today were about 575 um, I think you may see it if you look at seasonally you typically have a little bit of a rally this time of year into uh, early to mid May and so you might go back and challenge uh, 595. I really don't think we'll go through six dollars unless and until there's some problems in the growing crop. Uh, beans, um, I had to look. I can't recall the market's been moving so much. I can't recall where uh, November beans closed today. I'm going to say it was. Uh, was around uh, thirteen dollars, but let me look before I misspeak. Uh, November beans closed at thirteen thirty-three. Um, if there is a new crop commodity that might might have some explosiveness to it, it would be beans. Now that's going to be led by the old crop situation getting very tight. Um, I think you might see. Without that uh, real explosiveness, I would say 1350 on November beans is probably doable. I and mean, we're only about 18 cents from that. Uh, getting above $14 is going to re require 
some kind of a uh, concern either in the United States or uh, demand spike that I didn't foresee. Any other questions? Yeah. Can we talk about old crop tightness in, in beans? Can we can we fix that by importing beans from Brazil? There are some beans that are going to come in from Brazil. Will that solve this current crop year's supply and demand? No, it won't. Um, there's just not enough that's going to come in. Um, and also the use of those soybeans because of the renewable diesel sector, uh, it will certainly limit the imports. Uh, so whereas we might have seen, uh, there's a soybean crush plant in Destrehan, Louisiana, um, and in the past they've used imported soybeans. This year they said they're not going to. Uh, it's because of the renewable diesel sector. So I really don't see the bean imports that's going to come in uh, busting or solving this supply and demand situation. It's still very tight. You guys are working on that. We are, right. yes. Yeah. So why well, we can't bring in an investor in because is that associated with the dollar? Or no, on? it's because of uh, where they're sending their oil they're sending their oil to the renewable diesel sector and that doesn't meet the criteria if they use soybeans imported to produce soy oil it can't go into the renewable diesel sector it has to be used for food i thought it could go in it could go in but then you put it go there's a dollar credit that you get by incorporating the, that uh, down the well, there may be some. You lose the credit. You lose okay. The credit. You don't get the credit. Okay. You can do it, but you throw money. I gotcha. Okay, so economically, maybe it doesn't work. I know what we were told you know, was that Bungie said that they wouldn't do it because of the problems with their plant and not being able to IT the, the beans and the oil. Yeah. And so they said they weren't going to do it. That's hearsay. You had a graph up there with all the growth in capacity in soybean crushing. Mm -hmm. I mean, commensurate, there's also a growth in renewable capacity because those plants aren't always together. Right? Yes. Some of them are integrated and some of them are not. Are there any of those? You, you, they weren't on your, on your, on your list. But yeah. Do you know, are there any of those that are in the eastern part of the country that you know, would, uh, there, there are two plants, and I'm not sure that they're listed on here. Uh, they aren't. Well, no, I take it back. Uh, Bungie Cairo and Bungie Destrahan um, will have, they currently don't, but they will have the ability to utilize the oil right there on site. It's not there currently. I think that's the only two plants. Everybody else, I think, will have to ship the oil uh, to a use destination. And keep it in mind, most of your renewable diesel capacity is, is here. In New Orleans, uh, Port Arthur, Texas, California. Um, okay. Do you have a question? No? Yeah. What part is organic soybeans and corn playing in, in the overall market as you see it now and possibly in the future? Um, we use a fair amount of organic grains, whether it's corn, soybeans to make meal uh, and oil, or wheat, uh, milo. We use some different things to produce organic chickens. Um, the current production in the United States is very small. Um, there's some challenges to becoming an organic producer, uh, primarily a three-year period, you know, the transition period. And so it's very difficult, especially when you've got prices like we do today, for a farmer to say, you know what, I want to go ahead and become an organic producer. It's not that economically easy. Um, so domestic production currently is pretty small. 
but it's increasing. Um, and we see our demand as being pretty solid to growing. So currently we import a lot of organic stuff. Uh, it comes from Argentina, uh, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, some from India. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, with higher commodity prices the last couple of years, has it affected Purdue or can it pass it on? Um, our chickens are not real pleased, I guess I would say that. <laughs> our chickens would much rather eat cheaper corn and cheaper meal. Um, the, the overall margin, and I'm talking about all of agribusiness, uh, grain handling, grain processing, cattle feeding, hog feeding, chicken feeding, overall the environment has been pretty good, uh, favorable for margin structure. Um, have the high prices impacted companies? Most certainly. I mean, uh, and especially the volatility. I mean, just incredible volatility. Um, so there's challenges to it, but overall the demand has been pretty good. Any other questions? All right, well, hey, you can get home and watch uh, San Diego State or UConn uh, <laughs> see who wins. Huh? Thank, thank you very much.